Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta, Georgia on this beautiful Sunday morning of March 14th, 2021. We are part of a liberal religious tradition and we welcome all the joyful and the heartbroken, the straight and the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. We welcome polytheists, monotheists, atheists, and everyone in the spaces in between. All who are searching, seeking, looking for more, all are welcome here as we walk each other home. My name is Ruth McClellan Nugent, and I will be your worship associate this morning. We have a guest in the pulpit for our sermon. That's Dr. Holly Pinheiro of Augusta University. And now our music director, David Neches, will announce our opening hymn. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Can people hear me? Good. We were having a little technical problem there, but I'm back with you now. Um, it's a beautiful day out there. Our opening hymn is uh, not even a hymn at all. It is a song, People Get Ready, by Curtis Mayfield, and it is sung by Kigwana Cherry, and I think you're going to like it. announcements from our board member, Ted Newton. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Humanist Free Fraught Group will be meeting tonight at 5 p.m. on light. Um, please contact Frank Carl for that information. The Midland High School Age Youth Group will meet this evening online at 6.30 um, to 8 p.m. And the Zoom link is in your e-announcements. The UU Monday Meditation Group Gathering will meet online and face-to-face -face in the sanctuary in a hybrid meeting tomorrow evening, Monday, March 15th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Contact Elizabeth McNabb or Melanie Roberts for that information. Now, those individuals who are interested in meeting in person in the church on Monday nights should get in contact with Chris Garcia and let him know by today. The Wednesday Evening Exploration Group meets this Wednesday, March 17th at 7 p.m. via Zoom and will begin discussing how to be an anti-racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Please call Jan Parsons for more information. The UU 
a board of trustees will meet this Thursday at seven, at, pardon me, 6.30 p.m. online. This meeting is open to all church members. Please contact Alan George for information. Uh, the parents group will meet next Sunday online at 12.15 p.m. after the regular Sunday service. Contact Kim Miner for information. A reminder that Sunday RE classes for school age kids K through fifth grade have resumed meeting from 1010 to 1050. The classes will be held by Lynn Bonner with the help from Kim Miner. The Zoom link and other information are in your e-announcements. And please check this week's e-announcements for contact information for these and other groups you may wish to register for. There's also a link to the UU calendar that may help you know what's going on in church during the week and the month. The deadline for the April newsletter is next Monday, March 22nd, and our church does remain in phase three for its reopening guidelines, which are posted on our Facebook page, allowing groups of less than 15 to meet in the church in appropriate rooms under our reopening guidelines. But please let your board liaison and church administrator know if you meet in the church. The seating in the church sanctuary has been arranged to ensure six feet distance between the individuals and some seating is arranged to allow for couples in the same household to sit together. Please, if you do meet, do not move the chairs in from their current positions if attending. And the link to the Georgia Department of Public Health COVID-19 immunization information is in your e-announcements. Immunized or not, please continue to follow the current CDC guidelines for hand hygiene, face coverings, and social distancing. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And now chime into our service. The words for our chalice lighting are In Memory of All the Flames by Amaret Calloway. In memory of all the flames that didn't die, in the midst of darkness, in spite of the darkness, we light this flame today. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Our joys and sorrows now will be turned over to our pastoral care team member, Jan Browning Parsons. Now is the time in our service when we share our joys and sorrows that have come into our lives in this last week. If you wish to share a joy or a sorrow. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, and now we come to the meditation portion of our service. Uh, what we'll do here is that I'll read a, a meditation to focus our minds on something. So if you want to kind of get comfortable and, and concentrate on that, and then I will chime us in and then chime us out of a short period of shared silence where there'll be a little graphic on the screen uh, to give you a visual focus for meditation. So just a couple deep breaths here. And this piece is called Gird Thyself, and it's by Jessica York. This is not a prayer that you may find hope, for hope is a luxury that some cannot find and others cannot afford. This is not a prayer that you find more love in the world, though I hope you continue to feel love and send love to those near and far. I pray instead that you may find tools a hammer lying half hidden in the grass, a roll of duct tape curled up and forgotten on a high shelf in the back of the closet, a wrench poking out the back pocket of storage. Take these tools and gird thyself, a hammer for justice, duct tape to hold together your broken heart, a wrench to grip and provide advantage in implying torque to turn objects, or turn the world. Take these tools 
and others you may find in places expected and unexpected. Take these tools and gird thyself, for weeping may last through the night, but the work begins in the morning. Now, our time of shared silence. In honor of Women's History Month, we've been having members of the congregation uh, give some readings. And today's reader is Lynn Dennison. Lynn? Good morning. Besides choosing a woman author for my reading today, I specifically wanted to choose a UU woman. Happily, my cousin meets my criteria. Lisa Hammond is a published poet, an English professor, and a UU. I'll be reading three selections from her collection called Goddess Sweet, and I think you'll be able to relate to these. The Goddess Does Laundry is the first one. Not all tides earth friendly. She uses good home methods, seventh generation, a promise of peace, salvation, soft suds, soft hands, soap, rinse, sort, fold, art of the infinite. She remembers scraping buckskin, beating loose weave linen in streams, washboard and tub, backyard clothesline, heavy, spending Mondays at the laundromat, quarters and a book. Grand wash, her right twice a year, now replaced instead with empty ritual, wash each day, tumble dry, low, hand wash delicates, hang to dry. Ceremony's gone. She tosses in another load, stands in the windowless laundry room, folding her past, matching the corners by herself. The second one is called The Goddess Sleeps In. She dreams she divided heaven and earth, culling sand and stone from sun, unweaving stars from wind and water, hanging each one. It took forever, but she had the time. Just before her alarm went off, she stopped the wind from scattering the world. Sandstorm writ large, mantle and moon not yet weary, and all her faith in grass still premature. She knew the grass would come, soften bedrock one patient root by one, knew her dry hands would tingle sharp with memory, no matter what lotion she used. She'd finished in time. That morning she shut off her clock, settled back into her dream, no need to hurry now. And the last one is definitely appropriate for today. The goddess springs forward. The stove is easy, microwave three beeps, but she can never figure out the car. Press menu, hold the knob, hit fast forward. She laughs, thinking of setting back sundials. When she taught first woman to watch the moon, 13 cuts on stick or stone, bone or horn, candle, water, hourglass. Her body marks nights and days, still regular as clockwork. Pendulum, weights and springs, 
face in our hand, minutes don't matter. All time will coil down. Still, she's glad her phone sets itself forward. One less task to mind, one less time to wind. For now, she stops all clocks, slivers time still, one more wayward moment, then springs forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, love that. <laughs> um, and now I invite you to share your generosity. This congregation is a theologically diverse religious community with membership open to all who are in accordance with our principles, our mission, and our values. We unconditionally welcome any and all of you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow with us as spiritual and moral beings. Our congregation is entirely governed by a self-democratic process. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of our spiritual values, and we recognize it as central to our personal and institutional well-being. I invite you now to, um, to share that generosity. There will be a graphic on the screen with an address where you may make your donation to the church uh, while we have a musical interlude from David Neches. have given, we are truly grateful. Now it's my uh, turn to introduce our speaker today. Over the last two academic years, Dr. Holly Pinheiro has been my colleague in the Department of History, Anthropology, and Philosophy at Augusta University. Dr. Pinheiro's research focuses on the intersectionality of race, gender, and class in the military from 1810 to the 1910s. Uh, he's a very active scholar, and he's currently the co-editor of a new series from the University of Virginia Press, The Black Soldier in War and Society, New Narratives and Cultural Perspectives. He's also a cat and a dog dad, a committed husband, a generous colleague, and an all-around great guy, and he is a lover of Batman, which is not surprising if you know that to his students, Holly is a superhero. Um, he was scheduled to speak with us a year ago, almost to the day, before we had to shut the church down due to COVID. Uh, we had scheduled him to speak on topics of race and social justice, which is something that he will address today, although I don't think it's the same sermon he had planned quite a year ago. But it is a delight to finally welcome him to our virtual pulpit, at least, to talk about his life and its intersections with racial and social justice uh, I give you Dr. Holly Pinheiro, welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. 
So firstly, I would sincerely like to thank the UU church leaders for providing me with the opportunity to talk with you all this morning. I'm truly honored to be here virtually, of course. Um, and as Dr. McClellan Nugent has reminded me, um, it's been a year since I was originally slated to speak with you. And honestly, I cannot believe how much our lives have dramatically changed in profound ways since last March. To me, it makes it even more meaningful to be with you here all today. And uh, honestly, before I give this sermon, I would also like to apologize if this is not as pristine as previous other speakers, while also adding happy International Women's History Month. Now, one year ago, American society forever changed in ways that no one could have imagined. In many ways, we are still dealing, uh, still living in the wake of the seismic shift that resulted in the tragic news of Ahmaud Aubrey's death but he would not be the last black person to be mercilessly killed primarily due to their race. Breonna Taylor and George Floyd would also lose their lives in unfortunate circumstances. Their tragic deaths did not go unnoticed by racial minorities who were unfortunately well aware of the track record of black people who had lost their lives due to racial discrimination. For instance, aljazeera.com calculated that between 2014 in 2019, that United States police officers had killed 6,557 people. Of that number, 25%, or 1,639 people, were Black Americans. Their lives, their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their struggles, and their families all mattered. But their lives, for different and unfortunate reasons, were abruptly all ended. Meanwhile, the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis captivated the nation nearly a decade before this. But for me, as a teenager, my life forever changed upon hearing the circumstances of Amadou Diallo's murder by the New York City police in 1999. Mr. Diallo was tragically gunned down 41 times while trying to reach for in his pocket to provide police with identification, which they demanded that he show. These and many other instances of racial violence demonstrated to me that some people believe that my life and the life of people who look like me don't matter. Now, I think it is important to recognize that Black Lives Matter is not a catchy phrase uh, meant to condemn those who are not Black. To me, it is a declarative statement that living safely and equally should not be a privilege to a segment of the population. When I was a youth, my mother, who is also a Navy veteran of 25 years, had many talks with me about how to act in public, how to be aware of my surroundings, how to not appear as a threat. This is not normal. But this is how my family and other friends that I know learned to survive. To be honest, this has scarred me and is something I deal with every day of my life. Now, my wife, who is not Black, often hears me say, there's a cop. And she's usually surprised when I notice this, but as I often have to tell her that for me, my life could depend on how I interact with these people. And this is not how anyone should have to live, but it is a daily problem that I deal with. Now, meanwhile, as Black Lives Matter conversations and demonstrations permeated the public discourse on a global scale, there were also discussions of Civil War monuments, particularly those connected to Confederate States of America or the CSA monuments. These debates have been raging in many cases since the monuments were originally erected in the late 19th century, as numerous people found these markers distasteful for promoting and normalizing white supremacy. Furthermore, it demonstrated to many minorities that some white people were successfully using history as a vehicle to oppress others. Now, thankfully, modern conversations about CSA monuments, particularly those calls to remove them, were finally answered by institutions and legislatures. For instance, my former employer, the University of Alabama, eventually took down a United Daughters of the Confederacy monument that was on the university's Pentecost near the library. For minorities like myself, this enormous monument, and it was huge, was not only an eyesore, but was a visible demonstration that the university openly promoted white supremacy on its campus grounds until last year. Each removal or debate 
over whether to take down these CSA related monuments was met with pushback by those who felt that their heritage was being taken away. Now, some of these debates surrounding the CSA monuments, unfortunately, nearly turned violent. And two events last summer horrified me. And both of them included historians, one being Peter Carmichael and the other Scott Hancock, who were only giving public tours about discussing how the CSA army was heavily dependent on enslaved people's labor to wage a war. Now, some racially conservative white men with high-powered assault rifles that they openly wielded decided to confront Peter and began yelling at him. This shocked me on a level that I had never anticipated. Firstly, their aggression towards him literally put Peter's life on the line. When all he was doing was honestly stating an indisputable fact that is known in the historical record by those who were in the army um, at the time. Second, it was surprising to me how seeking to tell an accurate telling of the significant role that Black people played in the Civil War seemed to cheapen for some people the, the history that no longer privileged a great white male narrative. I vividly remember having conversations with my students and also my colleagues on these events. And I'll be honest, it also made me second guess my decision to be a historian, that it was engaging in a historical subject that could lead to direct threats on my life, primarily because I'm Black. And it was within this social context that I began to ask myself, what can I do? And part of this was due to people repeatedly asking me because of my professional expertise for answers. And here's the truth. As an African-American and a historic, historian of African-American history, I do not have all the answers, nor do I ever want to give the impression that I do. And I was also struck by the fact that very few people, in my opinion, gave me the freedom and space to process what all of this meant, not as an academic, but as an African-American who, similar to many others, witnessed these events and wanted to know why this was happening and why now and what could possibly be done to address it. But what I did begin to internally formulate and later express was how we can take this critical historical moment to hopefully make an impactful change on our communities. And particularly for those who were the unfortunate victims of systemic racism even today. And at the same time, and I say this through happenstance, I began to have conversations with various locals of all races, classes, and gender about providing financial and structural opportunity or support for Augusta University students, clear, uh, particularly in the Department of History, Anthropology, and Philosophy. As my colleagues can attest, we have absolutely phenomenal students who continue to impress us every session, every semester with their resiliency and hard work. Personally, they not only inspire me, but they challenge me. These students come from all walks of life and locations. And regardless of where they attended school as youths, one thing is clear to me, they are all exceptional. And during my nearly two years of teaching at Augusta University, I learned that many of my students unfortunately came to classes with disadvantages that were not their fault. Sadly, some of them did not have the financial means to even purchase a book or to remain in school without taking substantial loans with uh, student loans, which could put them in long-standing debt that could impact them for decades. Seeing students not excel in the classroom reminded me of my own upbringing experiences as I went into debt just to remain in college. And I refused to have them struggle financially in the same ways that I did years ago. As a result, I made it a personal commitment to help these students because I want to empower them. They are the ones doing and making the history and they come from the communities that experience these systemic hardships. They are ones that push me to be better as a teacher and a scholar. And they are the ones that will improve society in ways that I can only dream of. Now it has been nearly a year since I began advocating on behalf of my students to various community members. And with the help of many colleagues, I have successfully raised scholarships for many first generation students who are passionately interested in researching and learning more about racial and social justice issues broadly. Over that time, due to my tireless effort, I have successfully raised nearly $30,000 for scholarships that cover tuition, books, and other fees so that the students can focus on the classes, succeed, and graduate. This is not something I was ever trained to do, nor is it something I ever envisioned doing when I started my professional career. But this work that I am not paid for is something that I believe in deeply. 
Now it has brought me tears of joy to my heart and my soul to see how it has impacted my students. They have written letters or personal statements about how they now have tangible proof about people whom they never met in the community are deeply invested in their current and future success. Furthermore, that their faculty members are willing to fight for them in and outside of the classroom. I am so joyed to see how these scholarship awardees have had substantial conversations about their future professional careers, with some talking about graduate school and others preparing for the professional world with resume building. Collectively, they are seizing upon the opportunities to empower themselves, and I'm thrilled to watch it unfold. Now, connecting back to my beginning points, I think it is vital to recognize that there can be light even in the darkest of times. I cried and still cry over the tragic circumstances for historically marginalized people experiencing um, in a multitude of ways. But yet, I can also cry tears of joy knowing that I've channeled my feelings and frustrations to help the students uh, reach their dreams and while seeing how their successes directly challenge white supremacy's normalization. And I would like to make a statement that those who want to support such racial and social justice initiatives can help any student at Augusta University, uh, which I'm also happy to talk about in ways in which I've done it. And Dr. McClellan Nugent has been very gracious with her time as well. But there are so many other ways that we can make significant and meaningful, but also lasting changes to our society that reflects more inclusion and less exclusion. I hope that my uh, talk inspires others to find their own avenues to advocate not only for themselves, but many others. And I would like to thank you for providing me with this opportunity to speak with you all this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Pinheiro, for that. Um, David Neches has our, our music director, has our closing hymn. Yes, uh, I think I, I can speak for everybody that uh, Dr. Pinheiro, uh, you were worth the wait. Uh, very good, good words and, and much to think about there. Before we get to our closing hymn, I would like to point out that uh, our offertory, which you probably recognized, was by uh, Carol King, who before she became a famous singer of her own songs, was a very successful songwriter during the uh, Mad Men era of Tin Pan Alley, where she survived and thrived, thrived as a songwriter for others. And she was a real pioneer of women in songwriting. And uh, after our hymn, our uh, postlude is going to be Up Jump Spring by the great jazz trumpet of Freddie Hubbard in honor of this beautiful spring day that we are having. Finally, I'm happy to say that our closing hymn is number 318, We Would Be One, and it is led for us by um, Ruth Pendergrast. And here we go. <laughs>
Thanks to Ruth and uh, to everyone who made our service possible today, including um, Alan and Dan and Stephen and Marcia, who do so much behind the scenes to make the technical stuff work. Um, our closing words are called Be About the Work. And this is by Andrea Hawkins Camper. May we see all as it is, and may it all be as we see it. May we be the ones to make it as it should be. Or if not us, who? If not now, when? This is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the call we answer now, to be the barrier and the bridge, to be the living embodiment of our principles, to be about the work of building beloved community, to be a people of intention and a people of conscience. Amen and blessed be. Thank you.